So, um, Dr. Elise, Fit, I, I'm going to try and say it right, Fitzsands, close enough? Yes. Uh, is going to talk to us about this. And um, it's such a fast moving target that, that just a couple of weeks ago, uh, when we had our other CLE, the President's Day CLE, she was on and she came on. And she said, just this morning, OSHA has I issued new guidelines that, uh, that touch on this subject. So um, I'll be posting links uh, to the written material in chat. If you can't get it and you still need it, send me an email. I am now going to turn control of the meeting over to our speaker. And wow. you are in control. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you. It is a fast moving field. And actually the, the law has been changing even as we've been preparing this CLE. And it, it's an exciting field. It's a wonderful field. And it's the field that um, is, is the future. There's no question about it. I'm, thanks to nanotechnology, I can do all these wonderful things with our, um, I'm trying now to pull up the screen share. Okay, share this one. Yes, here we are. And slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so I hope you can see me. I wish I could see you. It's the magic of nanotechnology, and it is magic, that um, takes science fiction and turns it into science fact, and is also um, enabling me in the mountains of the Alps to speak to the mountains in Roanoke that I haven't seen in a very long time. This slide, like many others, has a lot of information that I want you to come back to because this is how you can find me. This is some of the other things that I do with my day. And um, it's very important to me that you have this information and think about it carefully. As I said to John when we were getting ready to start up, in fact, I'm going to be very superficial. I hope I don't oversimplify because there's so much here to talk about. And I would, would love it if you please ask me to drill down in another meeting on many of the different topics. This particular discussion is based on two books that I've written. One is about um, genetic testing. And I talk a lot about informed consent. I focused on pregnancy because that's the one area where women have to make a lot of decisions that they can get blamed for later in life, but don't really have a lot of information in advance. Um, it's, it's very odd social question why we don't prepare people to be parents and women in particular before they're pregnant to anticipate some of the questions that are going to come up. But it was in writing this book, which was based on my thesis at Johns Hopkins University in public health that um, I had the time to explore the questions of genetic testing during pregnancy. It was also part of uh, a grant for the Columbia University School of Law. Oh yeah, I am a lawyer. <laughs> Usually I am speaking to non-lawyers and I have to say to them, you know, don't hate me for this and don't ask me about your landlord tenant questions in the chat box. But the other book that I'm extremely proud of is Global Health Impacts of Nanotechnology Law, which is both a discussion of nanotechnology based on my doctorate in the law of nanotechnology, which was the first one in Switzerland, and also um, an attempt to try and make the law reachable for a lot of people who think law is far away and scary. And, and one of the things that I try to do in my work is build this bridge. I tell scientists about law they don't understand and lawyers about science they don't understand. But in fact, this bridge is very necessary and it's, it's a function that's important for the rest of posterity and the rest of the future. And uh, the other thing is this book is actually two books because just recently it was translated into French. It's now Nanotechnologie pour tous, la révolution scientifique de notre époque. So first I'm gonna take a little bit of time to talk about the role of nanotechnology. It's the underpinning of artificial intelligence. It's the underpinning of big data. When you um, hear about those things, think to yourself, without nanotechnology, we couldn't store all that information and we couldn't have the 
high powered, swift communication to try and metabolize that information, to actually try to do something with it. So nanotechnology is a player even in the background there. And then there's the field nanomedicine. And um, that's about both medicines and devices. And some of us have an even larger view of the word health, which I will touch upon. And, and then I, I want to talk about how that impacts privacy, because many laws have been written recently in response to the way that these technologies, not just nano, but a bunch of other so-called emerging technologies, are changing our society very rapidly. And, and it's extremely important to think carefully about these changes. There, there are questions about stigma and prejudice in society when you talk about disability, which of course is the flip side of having health care. There is the new European law, the GDPR. And before you think you're far from Europe, you're not. I will explain that the jurisdiction is vast in this law and no one has challenged it. But the violations are expensive and it parallels many other laws, our own HIPAA, but also there are other European laws and there are emerging laws in Africa. And then I have some preliminary conclusions. I don't have the big picture conclusions because to be honest, I don't have the time to develop them. So I'm gonna divide this into four parts. First is the magic. And I am committed to the magic. I am committed to the idea that science fiction, if you're watching Star Trek, I think Picard is on Paramount now. Okay, there's Star Trek Generations, Discovery, all that stuff, everything they did that's in the science fiction museum in the University of Lausanne is actually becoming real. And it's very exciting and it is scary. It's true, you have to know a bit about it, but it's magic. And I'm going to show you that because people always ask me, is this stuff dangerous? And I say to them, it depends on the context. That is an extremely difficult concept for people. Whether it's dangerous or not depends on how it's used. So the problem is we have this explosion of possibilities and it's jeopardizing some values that were very deeply embedded in society, even if they weren't in com completely codified. And the nightmare is COVID-19 comes along and throws all our laws into disarray and chaos. And what does that mean? What laws are gonna still be standing? And then I have some ideas about the solution of how you'd strike the balance. So the first thing is this, there's no other word for it. My working assumption is that nanotechnology, it has a revolution for commerce that will revolutionize public health. And that is magic. In the scientific literature, when I first started my doctorate, they were using the word revolution about nanotechnology. And people cautioned me that that is very unusual in science, that there were breakthroughs and discoveries, but a revolution in science, what does that mean? A matter was always there. And the answer is that nanotechnology has us look at matter very differently. The physical properties of matter actually change at the nanoscale. So um, this, this gold, this wedding ring, um, all questions of happiness and health associated with marriage put aside, the reason it's gold is because gold is considered inert in what we now call the bulk size. But at the nanoscale, those little nanoparticles of gold can explode. And in fact, we use that explosion because that's how we can have the kind of really swift communication that you can be sitting in your mountains and I'm in my mountains and it's almost parallel in time. It's not a big time lag at all. Elise, let me break in very quickly to yes, say please. to everyone, I apologize for the problem with the, uh, with the passcode. I, it was clearly a typo in one of, at least one of the emails, but I am trying to get everybody online as quickly as I can. We have 189 online now. All right, sorry okay. for the interruption. Wow, that's great. So uh, for those of you, I, if you're in late, I hope you'll go back and look at the materials and write to me and ask me questions. There's no way, I said this to the CLE people, there's no way there could be no questions because it's too new. 
and it's exciting, but it, some of the things I'm going to tell you don't make sense. So this revolution idea, if you have revolutionary view of matter, then obviously you have revolutionary products. I mean, it's just true that when many of the people walking around were children, they did not have a phone in their car that they could watch anything they wanted, including my little conversation with you today. It, it's it's incredible, the products that we now think of as necessary that are revolutionary. And I believe we can translate this to public health. And in fact, COVID-19 has sort of helped that happen. So I'm going to take a few minutes at John's request to say to you, what is nanotechnology and why does it matter to the people here today? I want you to go right though in an arrow to the center of these three convergent circles because this is why it's so fascinating. We are looking at the convergence, the coming together of public health, of emerging technology. And as I said, nanotechnology is one of several and many of them do have a nanotechnology underpinning, but these are new technologies that raise old human universal human rights questions and new problems all at the same time. And that is a challenge to our international laws. I'm very proud to tell you that I took the photograph at the bottom. It is inside the Palais of Nations in the United Nations in Geneva. And that is the Swiss delegate. And he let me take his picture. So what's nano? How big is that? Well, there's a definition in science that's widely accepted. And anyone who knows the science, they can sing along with me that it's a hundred or less nanometers in one or more dimensions. And we are finding out time and again how really inartful and useless that definition is. There are actually things that people are working with that are considered one dimensional and two dimensional, and I still can't figure out how they do that. And if you think of, um, everything's made of nanoparticles. Nanoparticles is the unit of analysis. So if you think of one strand of my hair, the diameter of one strand of human hair, the diameter is 100,000 nanometers. So how big is that? What is that? Well, in, in Switzerland, they had a toy that they gave out in the stores called Nanomania that was the size of like a cold capsule. And it was very confusing. The scientists were very upset that I was working with in Lausanne because they said, these people are going to think that's the size of nano. But what nano really is, is economic, shot in the arm. Before 2015, it was $3 trillion of US GDP. It's protect, predicted to be $14 trillion before 2022, which is soon and likely to get that. So this is a slide that I'm nostalgic, you're going to have to indulge me. This slide was given to me by Dr. John Howard, who is the director of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in the United States of America. And it's nostalgic because it's when I was the coordinator of the Encyclopedia of Safety and Health in the United Nations in the ILO in Geneva, Switzerland. And because he's the director of NIOSH, with a budget that's larger than many UN agencies, we did invite him and he's such a wonderful, responsive person. He came for a week to be our steering committee chair and he gave a lecture that changed my life forever. He gave a lecture called Nanotechnology, the latest slice of global economic life. And that was Thanksgiving, 2008. And at the end of the lecture, I mean, it was a mesmerizing lecture, even though it was an hour and a half. At the end of the lecture, he gave me all of his slides. And this slide has stayed with me in just about every talk I've given because it's so succinct. It shows in 2008, already on the market, there were cameras, cars, car tires, glass coatings on, on, on windshields, paints, drugs, which we will talk about, nano silver on clothing, nano silver refrigerator linings, and nano materials inside sports equipment like baseballs and tennis balls. And this 
was changing already in 2008. The marketplace and the this, this concept of the revolution in matter and commerce and the need to really embrace this to make better public health. And John said to me, Elise, I have to apologize. This slide is out of date. There's much more than this on the market. So I use this slide to underscore the idea that nano is really ubiquitous in our society. And from the point of view of the law, that is extraordinarily important. Um, this is an ad for a casino named Nano, and here's the Nano Mania. And I have been focusing for many years on the question of how would you define Nano under law, as opposed to the scientific definition, which is um, very confining in some ways, because if you have clusters of nanomaterials, maybe they don't fit the Nano uh, definition of 100 nanometers or less. And if they are um, multidimensional, maybe they're going to aggregate in ways that don't look like nano anymore. But if you want to regulate these materials, because whether they're dangerous or not is determined by context, then in fact, you have a question of definition that really changes in the, in the eyes of the political judgment of the legislators. Now, nanotechnology as a tool for public health, well, globally, we now call that global health. And I want to say that I have an extraordinarily broad definition of health. So nanomedicine, to me, can embrace the fact that a phone can provide counseling for a person who's depressed and thinks about, if not suicide, then some other bad acts, and that they can reach their, whether it's their therapist or a helpline, in time to prevent that bad thing. That, to me, is still nanomedicine. But to show you that the privacy questions that are raised by this whole new way of viewing health and material and matter as a public health issue, the privacy questions are so important that in Europe, not only do they have laws about this, which I am going to address, but they have a huge database called Elixir that is run by the European Union. And if you look at this slide, you can see that they are trying to make large groupings of coordinated uh, collaborations throughout the European system across all types of medicine. So that that data that nanotechnology creates and frees up and makes possible to transport, that health data is going to be accessible across the system, which is great if you're a system, you should be very happy. But if you're a person, you might not be happy about it. And this is our first threshold question about nanotechnology because we don't really want the limits. It's about the context of how it's used. It's not about whether there are some uses that should be banned. And so one of the things that is a very important nanomedicine tool is big data and the applications, they're gonna give us great benefits in advance. They have predictive power. It's going to be able to be combined with genetic information, not only for gene editing and um, for manipulating genes, but just for having a very good picture of how those genes might react in, in face of certain triggers. And of course, nanomedicine, including, we've seen this in COVID, the whole telehealth uh, spectrum of, of wonderful devices, self-monitoring devices. You can go on an airplane and measure with your with a nano device on your wrist. You can measure your breathing and heart rate while you're waiting for the plane, when you embark, while you're on the plane, which is a very different environment. And when you leave and it can be recorded. And if you want, it can be sent to a medical center or a doctor. This is very cool. This is a revolution. This is the, the communicators on Star, Star Trek, but maybe somebody doesn't want to know that. Maybe you can find out somebody else's information without their knowing it. On the one hand, it's beautiful. We love it. It's early detection of cancer, diabetes, orphan illnesses will be able to be treated because from the four corners of the globe, you can find the people who might actually be the other members of the orphan family and therefore a large enough group to actually study. It's really cool. 
And I love this. This this um, photograph comes from Stockholm, where Ericsson, they don't fund me or anything, but they have a um, already a cruise control for this particular lady is a Harvard Law graduate, and she is blind and deaf. She is the 21st century Helen Keller Harvard graduate, and she's driving. And you can see that where you and I might have a steering wheel, she has a seeing eye dog. And it's going to be safe and accessible. And in a way that's going to make her normal in a way that she will be able to drive or already is driving in Sweden, I think, um, in, in a way that we never would have dreamed that people with severe handicaps could do. And the World Report on Disability already had embraced these ideas. They've already begun to talk about what this means for what we call the social determinants of health and what this means for the social construct that says what is disability and what isn't. Well, that's not a societal question. Of course, it has cultural components, but under law, it means whether or not insurance pays for what you're doing. It means whether or not you get time off from work or if you're just considered away from work. It means who funds whatever it is that you think you're getting as a service. This is from the National Nanotechnology Initiative webpage. They were founded in the last century in 1999. And here they're talking about artificial skin that actually has the ability to sense, to send um, signals to the brain. And this is a list, this is one of those slides you'll come back to later. This is a list from uh, a talk I gave last year at Nanotechnology about the nano applications that are already in the fight against COVID-19. And this slide is older than the vaccines that we now have competing with each other on the market, but uh, it was definitely envisioned that with nanotechnology, the kinds of manipulations, because don't forget the DNA of a, of a, of a virus is much larger than a nanoparticle. So if you can manipulate that nanoparticle inside the virus, you can actually look at vaccine development. And that is on this list. But the other thing, of course, is when we want to have nano that's powerful and toxic, we love it. The nanoparticle gets shot right through the walls of the cancer cell and into the tumor. But then we have another question. Maybe we don't want nanotoxic things with high nanotoxicity in our water supply or in our food. And we don't yet know what that means. So there are trade-offs when society attempts to provide for this new world of wonderful, exciting public health. And this is a, a theory that's not mine that comes from the World Report on Disability. And it says, that it's a social construct, what constitutes disability and health. Nanotechnology has shined a light on this. And uh, as we reveal new technologies, it both has to do with privacy and confidentiality around the questions of who's disabled and are we going to erode the stigma, but also who it is that's actually disabled and what's fair. How do you make equality? Well, you can't. Disability law teaches us it's about equity and not equality. And the famous example is that you can have a free vaccine for COVID. It didn't, this example did not anticipate COVID, but it's totally relevant today. You can have a free vaccine for COVID on the first floor of a building. That's, uh, you know, you have to go around the back and through a flight of stairs to get to that entranceway for a person who can't walk or has trouble with their motor coordination, that's not free. They have to hire somebody to help them get there. That's not equitable. You're not gonna get them vaccinated easily. So the theory is that equity around health has to do with something other than making everybody the same and treating them the same. It's sort of counterintuitive to other theories of equity. And then the problem is, what stigma is there around it? And privacy is our classic defense against stigma. If you don't know somebody's disabled because everybody has protected their information, then you're not going to be stigmatizing them. But 
it's the dilemma is not derived from the substance of the information itself. It's derived derived from the context, how society uses that information. And that is part of the problem. So let me show you what the problem has meant before. How do we protect people? How do we limit the use of the da data? I'm gonna let you think about that a bit because now I've said everything I'm gonna say about nano and I think it's time for a little break. John, do we have some questions I could answer during the break? Let me unmute. Okay, I have not seen any pop up, but then again, we didn't actually tell people to, <laughs> to oh. ask questions. So yeah, uh, use chat to ask questions uh, or make comments or uh, uh, say, boy, I'm completely out of my league here. Uh, but you're uh, not because you're <laughs> using nano even just to talk to me. <laughs> And, uh, and if, if you ever kissed somebody wearing lipstick, their lipstick has uh, nanoparticles to make it last longer and be prettier, and mascara too. And 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 that and it's probably been the result of uh, many many failed marriages as a result of it lasting longer. <laughs> uh, okay, so oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, I'm not going there. It's Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> in New York, I'm I know going what I to. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to post the link for the uh, CLE form. Um, the number is there, so you can do your your register your uh, uh, report online. But remember, you're supposed to print out a copy of the form and keep it for two years. Um, I I do want to apologize to everyone again. Uh, human error was partially responsible for the difficulties we had this morning. I have been sending emails all during this first half hour and uh, Elise has graciously offered to stay online after 10 o'clock for those of you who might need to get some additional um, uh, participation time to get your full credit. So um, uh, I really, I had kind of hoped, uh, could you speak more about privacy protections is there a lot of use by law enforcement that you can suggest defenses commonly involving nanotechnology? Uh, that is an interesting question because, because we do have, um, you know, not nano, but, but things like GPS trackers and stuff like that. Are they going to start no, using no. like, like mini bots to track us? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's again, a question of context. Okay, there's a lot of controversy here in Europe around the nano sensors. If you walk into a restaurant, they immediately take your temperature with your face before asking you, um, is it okay? Because they determine as a threshold matter, literal threshold, if you're gonna enter the facility. And then if you wish to enter the facility, they say, oh, you look okay over here. Um, is it okay if we continue to monitor you? And what that means is the police can be doing the same thing, of course. There are some very, there are some very scary scenarios. It goes back to my main point that it's about context. And um, yes, the rest of this talk is about privacy. I was asked to explain what's nano and why it matters in Virginia. And um, these are really sort of universal. We have, a, we have another question, which I, honestly just as i read it i thought that is i have no idea uh it says can nano be traced do, do the do the actual uh, uh bits of technology have some kind of a marker so you know who manufactured it or where it came from oh that's a little bit confusing because with synthetic elements yes but when it comes to the natural use of pre-existing, the pre periodic table of elements has been expanded because of nanotechnology. Please do not ask me to explain how you create a new element. It's sort of counterintuitive to my <laughs> idea of elements, but in fact, they're out there, okay? And so for the so-called <clears throat> synthetic elements, that's probably true. But if somebody just takes gold at the nano level, then, um, it's gold. Now, is, does it appear in products that it could be traced? That's one of the things nano regulation is trying to grapple with. You know, we, we have, we have, um, 
I'm not sure that it's nano, although I think it is. We have a law in this in in the U.S. that you have to in fertilizer, you have to be able to to trace it to the manufacturer because it can be used in making bombs. Yes, the, well, there there is uh, there is law about nanostructures in pesticides. Uh, I believe it's FIFRA that does that. I thought that was off topic, but I gladly drill down to that another day. Uh, I was just I was just throwing that out there as an example. I didn't mean I didn't mean to bring <laughs> bring it up. No, but, but you see, no, no, this is wonderful because you tell me when to go back to my slides. Uh, a couple more minutes, and let me. I think there was another comment. Um, wait, before, is, let, just let me okay. show you. The, okay. This is the sort of really fascinating thing because everything is comprised of nanoparticles. It's a unit of analysis. There isn't a subject that isn't touched. That's why I said when you talk about nanomedicine, I include a lot of things that other people might not put in that rubric. If the purpose of nano silver on clothing is to make it last longer, we now know that matters in Texas in ways that we didn't think so. And yes, people did freeze to death in Texas, not because they were poor, but because they had no clothing in a snowstorm or no heat in a snowstorm and therefore no clothing. So um, it is not really easy to put the barriers around nanotechnology. That's why trying to define it under law is such a fascinating exercise that I've been engaged in for eight years. Okay, so let me, I, let me... I, I buy a very broad definition of health and a very broad definition of nanomedicine and nano devices in medicine. Let me let me get us back on topic uh, and and give you this comment and then you can go back to the, the okay. PowerPoint. What is the timeline for widespread use of medical nanotech for common applications? For example, reconstruction, and I think that probably means like like uh, bone reconstruction or or skin grafts or what whatever. But um, I I think I can probably answer that, which is. It's already being used far more than we realize, um, but probably not as much in this country because of regulation, as opposed to elsewhere in the world where That's why they I recognize love the, to John, the technology. If somebody else, they'd say, oh, you don't need regulation, which is not true. But yes, um, the, the first time that I was aware of a clinical trial of nanomedicine used to regenerate new teeth that they grew in the lab from the person's own cells that they could then implant in the person's mouth. And, and there was a three-year clinical trial. The first time I heard of that was 2012. So this is going on. This is exactly why I say it's important for Virginia lawyers, all lawyers, to, to really start, you know, I don't want to turn people into PhDs in nanomedicine any more than I intend to make scientists into lawyers. But we do need to break down those silos and have better cognizance of what's going on in those related fields because they're not as far apart as we think. So I think I'm going to jump into slides now. Is that right? Yes. What people wanted to know about is the, the general... Um, regulations on the protection of privacy in Europe. And first of all, I wanna say it says it's in Europe, but if you look at the NYU Law Review article in the materials, um, it underscores the point that this is a global rule. And I will only touch on that briefly. It is fascinating because um, basically, as I said to you before, it's the information itself that determines whether there's stigma, whether there's privacy. It's not the situs of the information. So the European law says, if you have information about a European, that information is subject to our law. We don't care where it is. And I'm gonna very briefly touch upon what it is that that law thinks it's protecting and how it proposes to do it. So first of all, you have a really schizophrenic preamble that is both poetry and a tough stick. The preamble actually uses the words that privacy is a fundamental human right. And that is because unlike the US where privacy is perhaps 
given some constitutional or state statutory protection. Privacy is actually a constitutional right in a bunch of European countries. And there is a treaty called the Charter, the European Charter of Human Rights that says privacy is a human right. And people actually litigate under those terms. So that's a little different for us. But the preamble reasserts the fundamental importance of this concept. And then it, it, the rest of the preamble talks about the importance of the internet and the direct marketing and purchasing of goods and e-learning and tax paying that goes on through the web that really constitutes a trade-off between privacy and giving up your privacy. And this is really interesting for us because uh, separate from the jurisdictional question, they're really trying to grapple with the social phenomenon that nanotechnology is very much a player in and is very useful in healthcare and in medicine. And that is the fact that there's so much information about the individual right away and totally available. And at first, they, the, the political force, the critical mass was to stop what they call the GAFA, you know, Google and Apple and Facebook. They were gonna stop them. And then when they actually sat down as legislators and started writing definitions and terms, they realized not only the economic importance of these industries, but the fact that they were gateways to other economic work. And so they set forth a framework that's built on trade-offs. And they said, citizens are already enjoying these benefits. We can't take them back. But what we can do for the future is, first of all, stop the flow of information. And there is something called the right to be forgotten, which I will touch on briefly. And there are rights for citizens to redress data breaches. And they set up a supervisory authority, a commission in each EU nation and the EU itself. And that authority has enforcement powers, which I will talk about. And they envision a process of certification for data professionals, very close to what we do in HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act in the United States from the 1990s, where there are people who are data managers. So it's 88 pages, which for the, for the Europeans is a lot. It's every entity has a controller of data. They have a system for pseudonymization, which is different than encryption. In other words, if you find you must use words and names that can be traced back, you have to make up fake names. You have a segmented content, which I'll describe. You have the controller and you have these oversight commissions. So who's an entity? Well, a government is an entity. And although there are national security and tax exemptions on the, the limits that I'm gonna show you. A government can't just use any old information for any old purpose. The president of France can't get up and say, and therefore so-and-so is uh, living at this address unless there's a really, really good reason. The private sector that holds information about EU citizens, and this is regardless whether the data is processed itself in the European Union. So if there were European citizens in the uh, Virginia bar, then you're covered by GDPR about what you do with their information. And there's also um, a process. It doesn't matter if you're an EU organization, okay? And if you use the data to offer goods or services, whether or not there's payment, that behavior can be monitored within the EU. So I want you to come back to these slides because these are really hard ideas to get your head around. But basically when you receive incoming data from a European, if it's an individual or a group of individuals or a, in an association, you know, like the equivalent of the APHA or something, when you receive that data, you are receiving liability and there's a chain of custody. And if it's broken, you're liable. So when you get data, you get liability. There is a right to be forgotten. There is a requirement to track the data and show where it goes, both within your infrastructure and when you send it elsewhere. 
You have to have consent for that data. People have the right to call you up and say, where is my data now? Who has it this week? I don't want this person to have it. Can you send it back to me? Can you send me a list of all the people you've sent it to so that I can talk to them? And there must be, there must be a time limit on the use of the data when you receive it. So this is really a framework for structuring management of personal data. And I'm hoping that the case for why that management is necessary was made in my discussion of nanotechnology. We just finished agreeing that it's all over the place and it's changing all kinds of social relationships and it's changing definitions of health and disability and it's changing who's disabled. And we have all this information about these people. So the law specifically talks about lawfulness, fairness, transparency, which is, I think, a, a European and that, uh, euphemism for democracy because not every country is as democratic as other dem democracies might think. So it's the ability to go to your government or the decision maker and say, where'd that idea come from? How come, you, what information did you use to come up with that decision? Why is this decision written this way? That's transparency. And it has to be processed in a lawful, fair and transparent manner for a limited purpose. And there's a concept that we never had in the states of data minimization. HIPAA does not talk about this, but the idea that you only collect the smallest amount of information you absolutely need. And it has to be accurate and it has to be stored in a manner that the person could check up on it if they wanted and either change it or fix it. So just in case you think this is pie in the sky stuff, and maybe some of you remember a law review article you might've read in law school that I'll mention at the end, but the first GDPR fine arrived in 2019 and it was big and it was a major employer. It wasn't about hurting the little guy and holding them up as an example. Contrary water, British Airways, was hit with about a, a 170 pound is like 180 million, 100, 183 million pound, so 200 million penalty, not because of data they had, but because of a flaw in their system, which they recognized. Can I can I jump in with a question here? Real Please quick? do. Um, this One's is their personal... press release. I'm not going to read it, but this is the press release for this fine. Okay. Uh, once personal data is uh, anonymized by a medical provider before it is shared with big tech, does the individual lose their right to object to the use of such data? So if, if, it's, if, if their identifying information is removed, but the, but the substance of the, the test results or whatever... Um, can, can they still object to that? That's the purpose of GDPR. You got it, bingo. That's what it's there for. Because they'll always have the raw data. They don't destroy the raw data, although they have a time limit of how long they can keep it. And so long as they have the raw data, they, they are still accountable under GDPR. They are not out from under. That's how um, British Air got caught in the net, because they had the information. They possessed it. So GDPR in its 88 pages, yes, absolutely. GDPR in its 88 pages talks about who owns the data, where does it go, what happens when it gets there. The, the person whose personal data is involved has the right to ask you, where is it going? Why do they want it? What to do if it's wrong? How it's going to be used? Even in automatic decisions, you know, you apply for a, a credit card from um, your favorite credit card company, and in a few hours you get an email whether you have a credit card or not. Those are logarithmic, nanotechnology-based, automatic decisions, but sometimes they're on a much bigger scale. They're about, about mortgages. They're about um, the, the transactions of multi-party owners of large real estate deals. We don't just use it for individuals, but at the bottom there's individual information. And of course, if there's a breach, there are fines. So this is a list of the things that people 
have to be aware of when, when you provide your data, you have to be told these things that are on the list here, its purpose, there are only a few purposes that are exempted from this and they're usually government related and they have to be legitimate. It can't be that somebody says, well, I work for uh, the, um, the healthcare monitoring and I need your tax information. Uh, okay, let me break in again very quickly. Yes, uh, first of all, the person who asked that question now says, uh, I might have missed this. What is the U.S. equivalent to the EU's GDPR? Um, oh, I know the answer no, to that. You didn't miss it. We don't I have know the one. answer to that. <laughs> we don't have one. The reason I'm telling you about it is not just an intellectual exercise, but there really is EU jurisdiction over over European data anywhere in the world, including Virginia and the USA. But no, we uh, don't have it. Yeah, but we me... are on the verge. You, you, these, these are wonderful questions. This person totally gets it. So they uh, are obliged to tell you when you provide data that it can, all these steps that can be done to, to change it and that you have a right and that you have access to it and what's very interesting, these, these texts are from the GDPR webpage, that um, guide that I showed you at the, at the beginning after the break. They have a lot of hypothetical cases and they talk about even if you were targeted through the use of profiling techniques, you have the right to go back and say, I wanna know how this profile was done. Okay, so, it's, so it's, so uh, the, the follow-up comment of that is it said, uh, some, she said, is, is it the California Consumer Privacy Act? And then somebody else commented, that's, that's the close, closest equivalent we have in the U.S. Yes, we have a very a, smart audience. Exactly. And then a couple of more questions. Um, but this there, governs 800 million people. <laughs> Is there a way to limit liability by differentiating how much data you collect based on whether or not a person was from or related to a place that demands the same protections? So only adding additional protections where necessary. Uh, I, I, think, I think if I can paraphrase that, what they're saying is when you're aggregating data from, from more than one uh, national uh, origin, do, can, can you, can you, tailor it to each specific individual for what their country requires, or I, I, I think as a practical standpoint, you couldn't do that, but I, but I, I think suppose you this could. Work for lawyers. I, I think the short answer there is this is work for lawyers. The purpose of GDPR is that it should be a transparent, clear line. I wrote my name, I signed a document, the document went to the credit card company, they sent it to the people that they tell me, evaluate credit card information, who then put it through a machine that I have the right to take it back or know more about who they sent to as consultants. In theory, it should be a clear straight line. In practice, does it really happen that way? I don't know. It is true that even though this is an EU law, there's a very complex treaty system within the EU that tries to harmonize the laws of all the 26, seven or eight nations, depending on if you count Brexit and Switzerland. But in fact, the reality is the goal is yes, you would be able to pull out, to be able to say, I don't want my data in there anymore. I want to pull this strand off my hair and I'm not putting it back. All right, and we have, a, we have another question, which again, I, I think I know the answer to, or at least partially. If nanotechnology- You're gonna have to keep me on time now because I have, but this well, is- Well, but remember, we're gonna, we're gonna go over sort of purposefully for the people that got in late. So, so okay. uh, I, I will at this point remind everybody Depending on when you signed in, you round up after 45 minutes to the hour. So, so once you hit that 45 minute mark, uh, if you've got other things to, to do today, uh, we won't be we won't be remotely offended if you take your CLE form and and go off to take care of business. But we will stay online for at least 15 yeah. minutes longer um, to. Uh, uh, make sure that everybody can get up to that roundup time. 
Um, are we getting so, more I'm questions? I'm by the questions. I think it's just We're wonderful. Getting, well, you know, uh, I personally think that that taking questions is better. So, so we're getting more questions. So let me ask this one. If nanotechnology is incorporated into a medicine, uh, how can it be used to track someone? Uh, do the nanoparticles remain inside the person? Uh, I, oh, I know, I know the answer oh, to that. I want to do of. a different talk about that. I want to do a different talk about that. And let me tell you why it depends on what medicine. Okay. Right. That's what, that was going to be my answer. Um, this is really a hard, but the information about who has used that medicine, which patients, that's going to be under GDPR. Yeah, and this is a very good question. How available is the knowledge of these rights to the average EU citizen? Um, it's, very, it's very well known now. Yeah, I was, I was going to say. They engaged in, the, a, in a major publicity campaign. The question goes on to, 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 to describe what I would refer to as sort of the standard U.S. regulatory practice, which is to bury it somewhere in the CFR and then tell people, well, we're sorry you didn't know about it. They don't do that in Europe. Well, they do, but uh, not, let me go back not, to this Not with preamble. this, not with this. This preamble is very important here because you're talking about people that were outraged at the behavior of social media companies. And even though Google lives in Ireland and uh, they have very good relations with a lot of the big companies, people felt their privacy intruded upon. And the key difference here is we're waking up to that now, thanks to a lot of events around elections that involve the use of social media in unanticipated ways. But in fact, the reality was that the privacy that they felt was intruded upon is a fundamental human right under their constitutional law of their countries and of the countries that signed into the treaties that are part of this system. And in fact, the law was criticized for not going far enough. And because I'm tailoring my comments to an American audience, I didn't really want to dwell on that. But the people felt somewhat betrayed because they, they were outraged at the loss of privacy through social media, which of course is complex because you, you have informed consent, you sign on to social media. You, unless somebody is fraudulent, they don't make a, 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 a Facebook account without your name, without your consent, without your signing. If it's fraud, there's already law for that. If it's identity identity theft, there's already law for that. But if it's yours and somebody puts your picture up in their page or the sonogram of your grandchild, which we don't know in 20 or 30 years, if that grandchild will have a cause of action because their sonogram was on Facebook, but there are sonograms on Facebook. So this is very important. The, the knowledge base in Europe is a very highly educated, sophisticated, in many cases, wealthier than the US general population. And they have a fundamental human right to privacy that they felt as a, as a polity, they felt was violated. Let me, and let so, me, so let that's me where in. the publicity around this comes from. How much jump time in do I have left so I can get through slides? And then we can- uh, Okay, if you, wanna, if you wanna just pick up with your slides and go through after this question and then we'll take more questions yes. at the end. Yes. Okay, As so I'm this question I think is, I think this one is important though. Is there a difference between health data and commercial data and does the individual have greater rights with respect to health data than to consumer data? That's what's so fascinating about GDPR. They don't make that distinction. Because uh, because I think I think that's an interesting question because um, with with consumer data there very often not always but very often is a direct trade off in well, exchange for your information you're getting a direct John, benefit this is with what we medical have to information talk about. that's not not necessarily true it's John, a, it's this a societal is what we have to talk about in the spare time because yeah. this is the trade off that made the European Commission trim back from its original mission. Its original mission politically was to get back those privacy rights that got stolen through social media. 
And then they realized people sign up for this stuff. People benefit from this stuff. There's an, an entire consumer industry that never existed without this stuff that is really central to the economy, no matter where you are. And so they, they trimmed it back. Now, medical entities have procedures they can follow and of course have opportunities to encrypt information differently because that's sort of part of a tradition of patient confidentiality anyways. But the law does not make a clear distinction between commercial uses and health uses. It, the, the key functions have to do with transparency, fairness, and they have to do with the idea that um, when people give you the data, they know what it's for and you tell them that they have a right to have it back. And if you believe that you have somehow um, incorrect or been harmed by that data, you have a right to redress first from the company or entity, could be a government, next from the national courts and, and national dispute resolution mechanisms such as they are, and then the EU commission itself, the people that make the fines. So can I use this tracking to my benefit? Can I ask them to send my personal data to me so I can send it somewhere else? Yes. And there are procedures to follow for that. So for example, I had a former employer in Europe and I had some records there. And I said, I need this because I'm applying to something else. And they had to provide it and they did. They couldn't say, we don't have it. We don't know what you're talking about. And they couldn't say, you can't use it for that. They have to provide it. The, in, the infrastructure exists. Can I stop processing my personal data? Yes, come back to this slide. There is a right to object to the processing. You, you have my data, but I don't like what you're doing with it. Give it back to me. Stop doing that and keep the data. That's okay. But don't do that with it. Send it there, but not there. You can do that. And there are some exceptions, they're here. Direct marketing is one of them. There has to be a legitimate interest. You have to show that nexus. This is very brief, but you have to show the nexus between that legitimate interest and what you're really doing. And if you object to direct marketing, the company has to stop and they have to comply with your request. And there are remedies. You can actually get compensation if they're not doing it right. So mommy, where does fines come from? So there's two tiers of supervisory authorities, okay? You have the EU has this great big superstructure that is in development, that is changing and gestating as we speak. And within each country, you have these authorities and commissions like the ones that tagged um, British Airways. And it was not a data breach by them. It was a breach by someone else playing upon the flaws and vulnerabilities of their database. So that's very important. And there is a concept called the right to be forgotten, which as I said, you can say, take me out of here. I don't want this anymore. And John and I were talking as we were putting together the final round of slides for, the, for presentation to the Virginia Bar. In the time between commencing putting together these slides and finishing putting together these slides. On February 21st, Judge Solis went on to um, CBS this morning for Sundays, CBS Sunday morning. Very sad, tragic story. Somebody wanted to kill her and assassinated her child. And she wants to have the information of judges and similar officials who are making controversial decisions, completely erased from public databases. That is the GDPR right to be forgotten. That is the personalization and embodiment of it. Will we see that in the US? I don't know. Will it be a standalone statute or will it be part of something similar to GDPR? I don't know. I just wanna to say to you that um, here's an example from their website. They talk about a cyber attack upon somebody who actually owns the data legitimately, people gave it to them, but the weaknesses are preyed upon. And because of that, there's not adequate security and there's a breach. That's where 
the British Airway fines came from. So this stuff comes from this really scary building, the European Parliament in Brussels. I've had the honor and fear of being in that building a bunch of times. And what I want to say at this point is, you know, how different, I want to answer the California question. How different is this from the other things that we're seeing on the privacy landscape? Well, Europe speaks with one voice, but they cheat. They speak with one voice twice. There's the European Union, I've been talking about GDPR, and there's the Council of Europe where I've actually worked, and it's a wonderful organization with 47 nations. And you can have a marvelous jurisdictional debate someday, there probably will be, about which countries that are in one and not necessarily the other are still European. Theoretically, if you belong to one, you're European. But what's very interesting here is it's the Council of Europe that is the home of the European Charter of Human Rights from the 1950s that has a right to privacy where individuals can come to their court and sue their government and have actually privacy is one of the few areas where people have successfully won against their government. So you have this very strong heritage of privacy law. They have a very complex internal structure. They're elected parliamentarians, just like the European Union, except they're a parallel place. So wouldn't you know that in 1981, they had a convention for the protection of individuals with regard to what was then called automatic processing of personal data. I'll bet there are people in the audience that are younger than this convention. But there's two things to take away from this convention. First of all, the Europeans are much more visionary and forward-looking than we are in their laws. I don't know the reason. Don't ask me, is it they're smarter? Is it they're richer? They are. Automatic processing is a strange phrase today, but in 1981, it's what they called big data and AI. So they had this vision. They had this rule, which is still alive and well. More than 50 countries have signed on board. I did say there are 47 in the Council of Europe. Depends on how you define country, right? But more than 50 countries have done it. There have been subsequent protocols. There's a declaration on risks to fundamental rights stemming from digital tracking and other surveillance policies that is passed as a, a convention in 2013. This is a list, please come back to this slide, don't make me read it to you, of all the different protocols around these conventions. They have encouraged proactively data protection and privacy conferences in Africa and 15 out of 54 countries participating in those regional meetings have started to adopt a convention on cybersecurity and personal data that was written in 2014. So GDPR is not alone. Is it the head of the class? Is it the symptom or the problem in terms of how we manage data? I don't know. That's, that's really a hard question because it's a rapidly changing field. What I can tell you is that we in the States have remarkably little privacy protection. We, we have only one or two constitutional cases that really talk about privacy as a, a, a thing in itself. And we have a lot of state law around privacy. We have a few notions of privacy in the federal level and the common law. Most of them tend to be around reproductive rights and freedoms and we have federal uh, Supreme Court law about, you know, contraception among married people, but we don't have the kind of privacy jurisprudence that is vibrant in Europe. And we do have, of course, HIPAA, as I mentioned, but we don't have that, that really strong, HIPAA met a lot of opposition when we said we were gonna protect the confidentiality around um, personal information in healthcare because it became so cumbersome and complex to put in encryption and, and various internal systems to remove, de-identify the data and the individual. And we have a different view of, of privacy. So the nightmare, of course, everybody knows is that GDPR has its limits. It specifically says governments can override it in emergencies. And we are living through an emergency. 
we just are. It's one of the longest emergencies, but it's certainly very, very powerful in hurting people. And governments everywhere in the world are just writing executive orders without asking legislators and without asking constituents. And they're overriding all kinds of rights. And they're keeping some of their rights, like collecting taxes, but we don't know where GDPR is going to be in this. Here is the very handsome French President Macron. He passed a huge executive order just 48 hours after our own president did. These are two totally different views of how you protect people. That pen in Macron's hand closed all the schools from, um, from preschool, creche, which is mandatory in France, through the university and closed businesses. It was so funny, he did it on a, a Friday and he said, um, we're gonna have a very nice weekend and Monday everything's gonna be closed. And he had the power to do this, although he kept the elections open because they have a national local election system where all the elections for mayor are held on the same day. So they kept those open, but other things were closed down and where does privacy and GDPR compliance fit in this? If, for example, you can tell somebody that they have to work at home and they're taking their files with them off premises and putting them in their little computer to do their remote work, where's your GDPR compliance? So these are very, very strange times. And what is that going to do to this? Will we still have treatments that are alternatives. You know, uh, everybody's getting vaccinated. They're on lists. We're all happy to be vaccinated. We're glad to get rid. But what kind of precedent is this for the kinds of privacy rights and informed consent that's required to set that chain of GDPR into motion? What, are we going to be able to refuse treatment? Are we going to say, well, you know, in COVID, we made people do that. So maybe this isn't so important. We know much more of the identity of people. We have nanosensors, as I said at the beginning, that are gonna tell you if you have a temperature and you can enter a place or not. What, how is GDPR gonna deal with that? So the solution is not easy. The solution is really a balancing act. And I do think that the, the European Commission got it right when they said privacy is a fundamental human right, the big print gives it to you and the little print takes it away because you have to wake up to the reality that preventing stigma and, and maintaining the kind of privacy that nobody will know about you is sort of a dream in itself. And the best solution is, of course, we work hard to fight stigma, but also to operationalize right to know to recognize that very few secrets can be maintained in a contemporary context. And, and that's not only individual privacy. If you look at the global COVAX effort collaborating to make the vaccines that we were able to get within a year, obviously they had to give up some kind of right to proprietary information just to work together. They may fight for a decade who owns the information when they finish and everybody's well to fight about it. But this afternoon, they all had to give up some kind of proprietary information or privacy in order to function. So these are very, very difficult questions. And the GDPR is really on point here. It says that social interactions like social platforms and creating new opportunities they, they pose risks to privacy. The frontierless nature of the internet enables the free flow of data across countries. And that brings challenges. Wow, this sounds like something I heard in law school. I don't know if you guys ever saw the very, very famous um, Harvard Law Review that right to privacy from 1890. But Justice Brandeis, when he was just a little baby law student, and his friend, Mr. Warren, were complaining that somebody put in a newspaper, a photograph of a friend of theirs as she was going to the ball with absolutely never asking her permission. She didn't even want her photograph taken. And they said, instantaneous photographs and newspaper enterprise have invaded the sacred precincts of private and domestic life. 
and numerous mechanical devices, which is what they called automated <laughs> data processing in the 1980s and what we call big data today. Numerous medical devices threatened to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. And what I think is the takeaway out of this is that this, this wonderful prescient picture that Warren and, and Brandeis clearly saw for some magical reason is becoming much more of a reality. It's always cited in the dissent. They always say, you know, oh, if we had privacy, then we would be able to do what Brandeis said. No, science fiction is becoming science fact. And so GDPR and privacy and its interaction with these amazing technologies that I told you about in the beginning, they're really raising many questions for Virginia lawyers just even under our own domestic law. And the privacy laws in the EU, I believe that they used HIPAA as a model when they looked at encryption infrastructures and, and data managing people, even though they call them data certification. But it's more than a nice uh, walk in the foreign law just to see what the landscape looks like. It's not just an intellectual walk. It impacts Virginia legal practice because of this jurisdictional question that I told you, that it's the possession of the information regardless where it is held. And this is probably going to be a model either for future laws, if for example, we do have a law that protects information of certain officials. And it's clearly a trend that's in Africa, which I would love to discuss another time too. But law protecting privacy forces us to think carefully about how we're gonna integrate these equity concerns from disability law, this idea that it's really about the social construct around the information and how it's used and the context much, much more than where it is. And what I say in conclusion is Warren and Brandeis were not dreamers. They were visionaries. And it's possible that their time will soon come. So I hope you liked my talk. I am absolutely thrilled we've had so many questions. And um, I think that you can call me anytime and I'll stick around for everybody who wants to talk and ask more questions. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, I am. I think this has been one of our most energetic <laughs> seminar so far. Um, let me let me first ask you, Elise, if you would uh, throw control back over to me. If you're how do I to, do that? I'm delighted. I'm um, delighted to do that. Well, that's a good question. I'm. I, I think you need to click. If you see my picture, click on the three little dots, and yeah. uh, and it should say "Make me host" or something like that. Make host. You're done. Okay. Change host. I'm out of uh, here. I am now the host. Don't leave. Don't leave. I won't um, go anywhere. Uh, we did have one other comment that came in uh, when you went back to your slides. It says, I've always been amazed that while Americans seem very concerned about their privacy vis-a-vis -vis the government, they are totally dismissive or apathetic to privacy within the commercial or private sector. Um, I, I think that that's changing somewhat. No. Uh, but let me, let me... I think it's changing, but I think it's true. I think yeah, it is it's true. true and it but it but it's I think it's getting less true. But now let me ask you cuz this is a topic that I, I I'm I'm not taking a position although I guess it's going to sound like I am but but cuz you have Go to ahead, phrase take the a question. Position. Well well, well I, because, because I'm not sure I have a position is what I'm saying is now medical nanotechnology Yes, there are individual benefits, unquestionably. But the primary benefit that I think we're going to get from the use of nanotech in medicine is the societal benefit, the fact that we're going to understand diseases better, the fact that we're going to have better ways of treating diseases. So you could make an argument that you should have less privacy to your medical data because of that, if it's properly anonymized. On the other hand, you could make the same argument about commercial data because it benefits the economy. 
So I'm, I'm just curious, do you think, do you really think there is a, a societal benefit argument to be made against stronger privacy laws, whether you're talking about uh, a, 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 a sort of a uh, greatest good for the greatest number with medical technology or benefiting the, the overall economy and, and benefiting everyone. Uh, so I guess that's my question is, is, from a devil's advocate standpoint, is there a counter argument to privacy? Well, I think it's a terrific question. It's what the EU grappled with in the preamble. It's oh, by the way, you can stop sharing your screen now if you want to. <laughs> it's up to you. I don't. I, I like saying the solution. Sure, I'll stop. Screen. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll stop screen share. How do I do that? You're in uh, charge. No, I, I can't. I don't think I can stop it. Uh, you're Go the ahead, one stop sharing. It. I, I don't think I can. You have to okay. stop it. Um, uh, oh, stop! Stop participant sharing. Okay, there we go. You have to stop it. There we go. You're the. Um, I'm the host. Right, 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 right. Right. So you have to. Okay. So there's a, a bunch of stuff there. It's a terrific question. It really gets to the essence of the difference in in the legal systems and also to what we think is privacy. Um, the, and those are two different things. Let me let me throw in a quick comment here. Um, uh, that says, uh, isn't part of the judgment on your question, meaning mine, uh, versus health and economics, the impact of the individual on information breach. So I think that's a very good point. Uh, the, the more serious the, the impact is going to be if the data is, is misused has to be part of the calculation. Well, it's more complicated. And I think this is where the GDPR is really wonderful. I think they understood when they were, they, there was just outrage at the sense of being violated, as I said before. And there was a really strong political will to um, somehow undo the existence of social media, which the legislators realized really couldn't be undone and is a social good in many, many ways and is the, the foundation of many new industries that were not envisioned even when the social media was created. So this is really the balancing act. Um, the balancing act is, first of all, are you going to think of privacy as a commodity? Because if it's a commodity, then you sell your information and you have rights to it. And it's a consumer model for how you treat privacy. If it's a social good, then you have a very different question because then morality and ethics play a much larger role in how you can and can't use data. And what the EU recognized when it wrote this schizophrenic preamble that I described to you is that data was going to be used in ways that nobody thought of and that nobody envisioned. When they consented to sign up for P Facebook, did they know that some foreign country could figure out what their political views are and try to influence them? Nobody even, well, why would you even think such a thing? It sounds so paranoid. And I mean, okay, these were uses that were not anticipated. And therefore the desire for a strong guardrail was very important, even though it was after the fact. The horse had left the barn, but when you build the next barn, you're gonna have to have the right to be forgotten, the ability to track the data, the ability to stop its use, the ability to tell people where it's going and ask them, oh, that's the other thing. You have to ask them when you send it to the next place. Now your question about whether nanomedicine is good because it's going to solve illness is also very complicated because not only are we discovering new illnesses we didn't know about, especially in the areas of genetics and orphan diseases. I mean, the whole CRISPR, the idea that you could remove the maternal mitochondria and put in somebody else's maternal mitochondria is so remote from any reality anybody grew up with in this generation that it's very, very difficult to say whether you've cured a disease or created a new disease because we don't know the implications of those decisions 20 and 40 years out. So we may invent new diseases and certainly 
COVID is an example of something that if I gave this lecture five years ago and I was talking about nanotechnology being useful to protect public health because of all the telecommunications that we could make available to individuals, without COVID, nobody thought that that was really important. And, and yet it's, it's a true lifeline and very important today. So the, the trade-offs regarding nanomedicine and cure are very, very complex because they involve variables that we did not think about at the time we launched nanomedicine. And we will have new diseases and we will have uh, a social construct around some conditions that may consider them to be disabilities or illnesses that weren't at the time that we started the research. So that's very complicated. But is privacy a commodity? I tend to think not. And in fact, I am very impressed by the, the whole COVAX collaboration because there were many people in the nanotechnology community who believe that intellectual property is an artifact of the previous century. And that even though a lot of people make money in intellectual property, it's a short-term benefit because eventually you will have so many layers of collaboration and so many types of ideas and some ideas that are generated through artificial intelligence and algorithms that it will not be possible to assign ownership of ideas and their fruits of, the, of invention. And if that comes to pass, then intellectual property will suffer the fate of um, privacy. Okay, so we have a comment. Uh, you inevitably lose some benefit from data when you, an I, I cannot say this word, <laughs> save my life. Encrypt. Anim animize it, encrypt it. Hell, I'll just call it encrypt, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to the extent required by HIPAA, uh, it matters where the patient lives, their background and other potentially identifying information. This does potentially hamper the development of data-enabled therapies or personalized right. based on machine learning. Yes, Absolutely. And, and also, if you don't have that data, you may actually teach the machine the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay. If, if, um, if race is a factor, why people live in a particular zip code where a particular illness is in a higher uh, percentage than in the general population, you need either the race or the zip code as a surrogate for race. You got to train the, the data properly. Otherwise, you're going to get replication of the previous inequity. I love the question. Yeah, let it, me. It ties back to the idea that disability and privacy are very, very close, and that equity and disability is a very important object lesson for talking about privacy in the greater society. And it is a trade off. It is let a trade off. Me, let me break in just real quick to uh, say to our now 83 people left online um, we, we certainly uh, thank you for being here. We thank uh, Dr. Sands for being here. Uh, everybody at this point is entitled to the full credit, even those of you who got on very, very late. So without wanting to, uh, to stifle the conversation, uh, at this point, you're here on, on, on your own time. <laughs> but, uh, and, and so I would also say at this point, if you want to turn your video on and unmute and have a direct conversation, uh, you can do that. Um, at some time, uh, once the, the why meeting isn't actually, anybody saying this ought to be another another CLE on this? I one. think there's I think there should be, and as soon as we know the date in October, maybe your travel schedule will allow you to be with us in person, um, or we'll or we'll I have to do it. something for the uh, the October uh, the online October seminar. Um, because uh, I can't get the data for attendance until we actually sign off, it'll probably be sometime after 12 that the vast majority of people will get their, uh, their notification that they're confirmed. I'll work very, very diligently to get everybody else done. If you don't hear from me by, say, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today, uh, do get in contact and make sure that we know you were here I'm also going to be sending out a, a mea culpa email to everybody who registered apologizing for the human error 
on my part that made John, it difficult for some it, people it to sign be in. It's five o'clock here because it's already five thirty. So I have a quick question. <laughs> could you please put up, um, since you own the show again, can yeah. you please put up my contact slide because I really want. Oh, to um. it, it's the last <laughs> and the first. It's it's the last one in the. Let, let me let it's me. It's also the first. Uh. I, I can do it if I can get to it. Okay. Um, this, this question. Oh, of, yes. Hi, Barbara. Speak to us. Yes. Hello. Barbara, were you were 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 you trying to reach us or? <laughs> um, so I'm going to put that slide back up now. Because I think, I think actually. The, the the sort of downside, there it is. The downside from the point of view of discuss, le leaping into a discussion of GDPR is that we have really um, not held the debate that has to be held in the United States. And that is the calculus will look different in the United States than it did in Europe because there's no, I mean, when I say there's a constitutional right to privacy, I mean that it matters to people that they actually go to a court to enforce it against a government. Um, I think the famous one was the Germans. Somebody had the equivalent of food stamps and somebody else knew they had them. And the government did not have the right to disclose that. Except, you know, within the government's use of the information, but not to a third party. And, and that person had reparations. And we sort of create fences around that in the states, but we don't really have the kind of um, fundamental constitutional tenet. It wouldn't be a due process question, I think. Maybe it would. So maybe we need to do something around a more fundamental debate and go back a step. And, and ask the questions GDPR asked, but find American answers. I didn't know that people were interested in that. I, I thought that I was really thinking in a more practical term that um, if you're possessing European information, you're subject to laws you don't necessarily realize you have to obey. But um, it might be fun to have that, to have a debate about what should privacy look like in America? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Let me get back to chat here. I had to close my window out and I can't sure. find it now. The two American influences that I find startling in GDPR is the infrastructural implications that come right out of HIPAA. And of course, Warren and Brandeis. I said when I read GDPR, these people read Warren and Brandeis and it's very possible they did. Uh, so, so we have, since you said something about it, had a couple of comments saying, yes, please do another CLE on this topic. Uh, <laughs> again, if you're still online with us uh, and you'd like to, to unmute or turn your video on and join in the conversation, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, we are, I'll, I'm going to actually just stop monitoring chat since we've made that offer. Uh, it's much easier for you to just pop in and, and talk about it. Um, so we were, we were talking a little bit about, um, the, when you, the, you, you mentioned the, the being able to grow the teeth. And I think it was, oh, yeah. uh, when we were, I think it was when we were talking after the presidential, uh, yeah. CLE that we, you talk about the, the ability to now actually like 3d print, uh, uh, tissue. Yes. Uh, which is, you know, that to me is, is just wild. The idea that we, that we'll be able to uh, essentially use genetic information to reproduce actual human tissue that, that can then be used well, instead of a donor tissue. We will 3D print the molecular structures. Right. And, and, I think we've been able to do genetic replication in labs. I don't know, but we will be able to actually use the individual stem cells from the I mean, individual. I think it's coming. So it will be biocompatible. It will be biocompatible. And it will not require the kind of, um, you know, the anti-immune uh, things to present, to prevent rejection. 
And as I told you, I think it will be the end of trafficking in organs. Although it's also possible we will have many equity issues around uh, who can afford new organs, who will have access to those organs. Do you, you know, is it like canning fruit that you only can the fresh fruit and you don't can the old overripe fruit? Um, is it is it going to be a financial question? Is it going to be uh, a eugenic question that will certain people will deserve new organs? Um, will we have infinite life um, that we could just keep? Uh, if you have enough money, you can just buy new organs and keep doing that. Will we replicate organs to make new people that aren't necessarily clones but are maybe our servants? And, and will, what will their status look like? I mean, these are very real questions. And I don't know where in the States it's being asked. Um, it's definitely being asked in Europe. Um, my, my guess is that if it's being asked anywhere, it's, it's not in the halls of power, but in the halls of industry where they're trying to figure out how to monetize it. Right. I think so. Oh, I see. I see somebody's talking about the sci-fi of the 50s. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, but you see, in industry, industry in Europe is very different because um, some industry is a creature of the state. I mean, that's that's been our our bone to pick with them for the last half century or so is, you know, that they Air France is owned by the government. And the workers have a right to strike, but when they strike, they're striking against the government. And um, so that mix makes it different. And I think it makes the government have a different role in shaping products and, and in regulating those products and having a say in what can and cannot be done because they, they do fund it, but also they're government entities. I think it's a very, very interesting question to look at, but it's complicated. We, we have a lot of people listening, but nobody wanting to join in. <laughs> I know. Well, the only thing I can say is then um, we should let them write to me and let's, and I'll write to you and me. You, do you get the chat, right? Uh, yeah, I get, I, I get that. Let's look at the questions. People write your questions, write to me, write to John, and we'll think about what we want the next to look like. I think uh, here's a comment. You know, I mean, as a, as a former social worker, States is you have a heritage of medical privacy and confidentiality, but it's very, very difficult to implement. That's why the Americans with Disability Act did not define disability; it defined prohibited acts. Yeah. Uh, so and here's a comment: as a former social worker, I found the privacy law is difficult because it was a block to services between agencies. As a former director of a battered women's shelter, the privacy laws are life saving. So that's right. it is very much it is very much a, a factor of uh, what your role in the system is as to how you view those those laws. It's a question of context. And as I said to you, when when I, I of course I feel terrible that the judge had a death in her family, and I see that she got. Um, certainly an, a notion of a precedence by seeing the right to be forgotten. But where is your transparency in government if all the officials have no personal information whatsoever on the web? At some point, you do need to be able to contact people legitimately. Yeah. And there has, if you remove them from the general web, you have to create a new pipeline where legitimate concerns can be addressed to them all the same. And, 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 and I'm, I'm fairly certain that, that uh, while judges and, and certain other government officials would probably be in favor of that, the, the politicians who actually have to get out and get the vote, I'm sure th the last thing they want is to be forgotten. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to be forgotten. I mean, I guess, I guess <laughs> arguably it means that the fewer, the more people forgotten, the fewer voices left being heard. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, my dear, 
it is food time in many nations. Okay. I think we should let people write to us and construct the second one. I've been just delighted to be here and um, with you, and I'm glad you liked it. And um, there's a lot to drill down to, so. Uh, hopefully, uh, as I said, uh, once we know that we're definitely gonna be live in person at Harrisonburg, maybe we can arrange your travel schedule. Uh, and if not, we are definitely doing the, uh, the fall seminar. So we'll look to getting a, a perhaps a, uh, as you say, get people to get, tell us exactly what they want to know. And, and then we can yeah, tell the makes. bar when we apply for the MCLE, we could say Virginia attorneys have actually asked this question. Yes. That's why it should deserve credit. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, and, I and think again, that's Perfect. Again, I, I, I do want to remind people, I, I gripe about our system, but the people who do work there, at least the ones I deal with, are very understanding. Uh, they are the functionaries. They are implementing the policies that come from on high, and I don't deal with the people who, 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 implement, who, who make those policies, but I deal with the ones who, who have to deal with people like me, and, and they've actually told me that I'm one of the nicer people they deal with. So, <laughs> I think so. That's nice to know. All right. Thank you it. so much, Dr. Now time for little girls, big boys. Our mountain uh, to mountain discourses. Um, I guess at what time is it there? It's probably about six, seven o'clock, six o'clock in the evening. Oh, you froze up. It's chow time. It's, it's chow, chow time. time. Okay. And it's curfew. Good. Oh, and a curfew, too. That's right. You were telling me about that. Okay, everybody, um, we're going to sign off now. If you have more questions, email uh, me or email uh, Elise, and uh, we hope to see everybody uh, at a future seminar. We've got the uh, repeat of the President's Day coming up for everybody who lost power in the winter storm or just didn't join us that day, and our first ethics session uh, on on the Ides of March. Oh, and, and, and John, you recorded this. So if somebody yeah, wants to go back we'll, to something, they right, can We're, we're going to post this on our uh, YouTube channel uh, probably late tonight. Uh, I, I have to obviously edit out all of the, the uh, bits that came at the beginning. Uh, but we'll post everything, including this conversation, on our YouTube channel, and, uh, and we'll announce that on the website. So thanks again, Thank everybody. You. Have a great Bye -bye. day. See and soon. we'll see you when we see you. Stop share and log off. One, two, three.